Uh, Luke Thomas again, Fox City Journal. Um, what will you do as president to address peak oil and petro collapse, and what will you be your first action as chief executive? Uh, beginning with Kent Mesplay. National energy independence is something that we could have if we had the political will. It's one of my key issues, and it goes under my uh, basic approach of treating sustainability as a security issue. Um, we, need, we need to treat every rooftop, especially in sunny areas of the country, as a power plant. We need to work toward uh, getting people off grid also because, as I said, um, regarding safety issues, not just when the power is out, but when there are, are other disasters, um, what we need is uh, we're better prepared if, if we have our basic needs net in place. And really, we need something like a, um, a national um, Marshall Plan, a, a new Green Deal. Um, we do need to put a lot of money into renewables, but I'd say just cutting the $40 billion in annual subsidies for fossil fuels uh, would help us create, say, 5 million green collar jobs. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Cynthia McKinney. Um, I basically would just uh, adopt a policy, leave the oil in the soil, and um, then our energy policy would utilize all of the green technologies that exist around the world. We could institute a jobs program by uh, having manufacturing plants in underserved areas that would manufacture this green technology. I would also make sure that um, we change the name of the Department of State to the Department of Peace. I would bring our troops home. I would do a lot of things concomitantly. Um, and uh, they, I would reinstitute Posse Comitatus. I would uh, deinstall AFRICOM and Plan Colombia. I would recognize and work with all of the emerging democracies in the world. Like, for example, um, uh, I would support Chavez in Venezuela. <laughs> Morales in, in, in uh, Bolivia and Co uh, Korea and Ecuador and all of those countries that have demonstrated that people power works and I would get the U.S. military out of Africa. Well, I have a three-page and growing list of the first things I would do as president. Right. So, Indian populations. <laughs> And, and various other great things that will be on my website as soon as I have time to put them up there. And um, as far as peak oil and petro collapse, um, we really need to look at uh, cleaner energy, but we all know that in this room, obviously, yeah. we need to look at, you know, putting the new solar film on any building. You can put it on the side of the building, you can put it on the top of the building, and it's great technology. And also looking at, you know, petrochemicals are used in so many things and the oil is better not being it's better if we don't burn it I mean there's so many better uses for it and so transitioning to a non petrochemical based fossil fuel economy would be a good idea thank you <laughs> Jesse Johnson well petrochemical has had a free ride for far too long all fossil fuels have uh, I know this uh, certainly without question. I come from Appalachia, where the mountains are being leveled at an astounding rate, destroying e entire ecosystems along with, with families, culture, uh, their the sacred lands. And not only that, but also the, the energy that's held within them as they're extracting one form of energy, they're destroying another. Uh, I mean, just simply. Uh, Mountaintop removal is ground zero for climate change. And every time that they blow a mountain up, not only are they ex exploding 300, in West Virginia alone, 300, uh, 3 million pounds of, of explosives, which are destroying the, uh, as far as greenhouse gases, not only are they taking the coal out, pu pulverizing that and burning it and, and in order to provide you with this. For every hour in this nation, that we have this kind of lighting alive, one mountain disappears in Appalachia, the oldest mountain range in this nation. 
Thank a you. new declaration of energy independence that's serious, not the same sort of thing that we've Thank listened you, to for Tom. 30 years. Thank you. Final, final comment, Jared Bond. I, this has been my favorite part of, the, of entering this race, was to ask, answer the question what my first thing as president will be. Uh, before even being sworn in, the first thing I would do is initiate the paperwork to get rid of, to get free all of the political prisoners in this country. Until, <laughs> until we deal with political prisoners, the, uh, the, the mass incarceration yes. uh, of, of people in this country, uh, the gross inequalities in wealth and income and access to health care, until we deal with the people first. None of the other issues can be used as an organizational tool. I, I, uh, 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 with all respect to the environmental, in, environmental concerns, which I take very seriously, uh, we can't address them uh, until we deal with the people first. So I would get free all of those political prisoners and initiate as part of that a reparations, uh, not only to them personally, but to all those uh, majority of the country and the world who have been disenfranchised, stolen from, genocidally dealt with, and so on. Uh, that would reconstitute re our relationship with our environment and with the natural world. And then I would uh, convene a panel, which would consist of most of the people up here right now, to figure out what to do specifically with Thank the you. environment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the first part of our program, a media panel. A round of applause for our members of the media. Thank you very much. We're going to take a moment to recognize the elected officials that are members of the Green Party. Uh, and if you're here, please come up. Larry Bragman, member of the Fairfax Town Council. <laughs> Mike Feinstein, former mayor of Santa Monica. Uh, Matt Gonzalez, former president of the San Francisco Board of Supervisors. Ross Mercurini, member of San Francisco Board of Supervisors. John Rizzo, trustee, San Francisco Community College District. Phil Rocky, city council member of Oakdale. Mark Sanchez, president of the San Francisco School District. Lou Tremaine, council member and second time mayor of Fairfax. Any other elected officials from the Green Party? If so, come on up and announce yourself. I see our elected officials coming up on stage. I want us to have a sense, a sense of appreciation for how far the Green Party in California really has come. Let's give a round of applause to all of our Green Party elected officials. such a great choice. This is true diversity. And I would like to see them go up against the uh, corporate mouthpieces for the status quo anytime. But this, this question is something dear to my heart. And it's for, I think all of our questions are for all the candidates. I don't think any of them are singled out. But how can the Bill of Rights be protected after the next terrorist attack? I'm very interested in protecting the Bill of Rights. Cynthia McKinney. Well, first of all, we ought to try as best we can to prevent the next terrorist attack. And the way that we prevent the next one is to understand the last one. <laughs> this is weird for me. Usually I'm the one that's am Let's start with you, Cindy. understand the last one um, because we haven't had truth around what happened on September 11th. Now, 
I think it was Benjamin Franklin who said that a, a population who gives up its, uh, its uh, rights, liberties in, in uh, exchange for security deserves neither. And so we do have an infrastructure. We have a military. We have an intelligence infrastructure that can perform for our country if we have leadership that demands that it, it perform. Cat Swift. Well, prevention is always the best course of action if you want to stop something. And uh, you know, we need to reinstitute habeas corpus, of course, so that we can have our Bill of Rights back. And, um, and of course, this goes back to the economic issue. You address trade deals that are unfair and you know, find out why it is that people want to blow up the American, something in America. And then, you know, deal with those issues at the core level instead of just responding to the backlash. Jesse Johnson. Well, I come from a long line of police officers, actually. And uh, first thing I would say for what has been said before me here just now is that, you know, we, we're in this so-called war on terror. That's, that's a war on a feeling. Uh, so I think it's a little misplaced. As a police officer, you know, a police o detective looks at the evidence and he doesn't look at one shred of evidence that's repeated over and over and over through the media or any other place, any shred of evidence that he hears a hundred times. He believes in the hundred shreds of evidence that leads him to one final conclusion. And I think that any terrorist act, which is the crime of the century, needs to be treated as a crime. It's not an excuse for war. Jerry Ball. Uh, war Churchill is right. That's right. <laughs> I could just stop there right now. Um, but we have completely, and I got this from a, a, a panel convened by our dear sister McKinney, where he spoke there. We have the polarities, I think he said, of the definitions completely reversed. What is being practiced in this country is terrorism against the citizens of this country. We have to deal with that first. Those who are resisting that are engaged in counterterrorism, whether we agree with it or not. That is how we have to understand it. We have to understand that for many of us in this country, the relationship we have with the institutions is terroristic. We are preyed upon, whether it's by the police or the military, or whether it's by economic uh, 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 abuse, through, whether it's through unemployment. That is the terrorism waged against us. <laughs> Until we build this party and this movement to deal with that, we cannot hope. Until the rights in the Bill of Rights, are, which have never been extended to everyone in this country, are in fact done so, I'm not really worried about preserving something after another counter-terrorist attack. Thank you. <laughs> Ken Mesplay. Yeah, I would echo what I'm already hearing, reinstitute habeas corpus. <clears throat> really what we need are more forums like this, more real debates where these real issues are discussed. One thing you can do is get more people to register green and support green candidates, especially local green candidates, because this is a long-range movement. So keep asking those questions. Don't be silent. Bear in mind, remind yourselves that war is terror and that our government terrorizes ourselves, or at least tries to do so, um, really take a stance. Get out there in every way you can, because our government is threatened from within, I believe, more than it is threatened from without. Thank you. Education policy in the United States is flawed at best. Um, can we hear from the candidates about their notion about how they would reform the major reform, which is no child left behind. Beginning with Cat Swift. Yeah. That's for everybody. Cat Swift. I don't know that you can reform it. You might have to just trash it and start it. <laughs> Unfortunately, 
unfortunately, uh, Mississippi is one of the few states that makes Texas look better um, as far as education goes. Um, and, you know, basically what we're seeing is a lot of youth coming out of school who can't read. They're graduating from high school and don't even know how to read. And so basically we need to go back to redoing the entire education system and putting money into it so that all schools are funded equally throughout the entire country so that everyone has the same access to education and you don't have wealthy districts and poor districts where there's a huge disparity in the education system. Jesse Johnson. Well, first things first, you brought up hemp there. I, I was, <laughs> as a son of a police officer, I know that most police officers wish that it wasn't illegal. It causes more crime by being illegal. It causes more political prisoners to Brother Jarrett's uh, point. But um, as far as no child left behind, it leaves all children behind. It's only success is allowing political warmongers inside and having access to our children and program them through free video games, et cetera, to make war upon their fellow human beings. Uh, education should be free to us all. Lifelong learning. That makes a great nation. That's the kind of forward thinking I'm talking about. And unfortunately, you know, we're seeing that kind of forward thinking out of the Chinese right now. When in, in our educational system, our, our undergrads are, are looking to the future in science and technology at about 17 percent. The rest of the industrialized world is about twice that. They're going in at 51 percent. Thank you. That's time. Jared Barr. Legalize all drugs. Um, <clears throat> As a uh, former teacher in the D.C. public school system and a current university professor at a historically black college and university, the, the, I see every day that the school system in this country is doing exactly what it was designed to do from That's its right. inception. Mm -hmm. As Donald Spivey said, this, the schoolhouse was instituted to replace the lost stability with the demise of the plantation. Until we properly fund schools, until we reorder the goals of the state, of you know, schools supporting as an, a supportive institution supporting the state, we will not see any difference whether there's no child left behind or any other non-named system or, or bill or policy. Uh, so we must absolutely, again, use the mechanism of the, in, in the electoral politics of the Green Party to have a mass movement that reorders our relationship as a community, as a society, as a nation. All of these other problems will fall in line as a result, and this is one perfect example of that. Redo the tax structure, increase teacher pay, support food programs so that kids don't go hungry, so that they can learn better. Get away from forcing teaching to the test. I've been a teacher as well. Schools are based on the model of the factory. Going way back, that's what they are, is they're factories teach critical independent thinking, and these days, I would say teach skills that are more applicable, more language skills. Bring back art and music. These are critical. <laughs> also help get children reconnected with the earth so that they can understand what really matters. If we don't protect our planet, all of these little small debates are not going to mean very much. Again, global climate change is a serious threat. Thank you. Final answer with Tenty McKinney. I've been um, playing with this little pin here. It's one of those little roll-out pins. And um, it's got our federal spending on it. And with the Pentagon spending at around $700 billion, can you imagine? and um, K through 12 education at like 38 billion. There's something wrong with that. And so uh, obviously we have to put money into education. But of course, if we do the things that Kent just said, then there will be more people who are members of the Green Party. <laughs> so 
they can't afford to do that, which means then, of course, that we have to run more people for office so that we can achieve this, this goal of having an educated citizenry. Finally, what I would say is that, you know, having been born in Georgia and raised in Georgia, we would always say, thank goodness, for Alabama and Mississippi. <laughs> and so now we've got children in other parts of the world who are saying, thank goodness, for the United States. <laughs> we, our children must be equipped with the competition from the rest of the world. And in order to do that, we have to focus on education and lifelong learning. We have to do that. Thank you. I'm going to ask a um, foreign policy question now. With This is kind of relevant since our president was just over um, in Israel saying he was going to solve this problem. With the, well, he doesn't solve problems. He causes problems. So, um, what strategies will you advocate to allow the Palestinians to gain their own state? Or, I'm going to add this part, do you advocate a two-state solution, or is there another solution that you think might be more workable? First of all, I would say that the United States, as, I, as I've always said, the United States ought to be an honest broker. And right now, we are definitely not an honest broker in the affairs of the Middle East. The other thing I would say is that we've got to stop our weapons transfers to countries over there, all of them. Um, the idea of transferring uh, nuclear tip bunker buster uh, weapons, uh, which was on the table at one point, and then they just decided, okay, well, we'll take the nuclear tips off, but we'll give these bunker busters to Israel. The idea of a missile defense, all of this is, it, inflammatory. I would also uh, make sure that the Congress uh, didn't pass these resolutions that are also inflammatory, like making stipulating that Jerusalem is the capital city when that hasn't been decided upon. In terms of a two-state solution, there are some who advocate two states, some who advocate one state, and folks just being able to live together. I would listen to the voices that are there and I would strip away the influence of the APAC, the American Israel Public Affairs <laughs> Committee, thank you, and listen to those human rights advocates who are there. Thank you. <laughs> Pat Swift. Basically, it comes down to finding out what is the key that's keeping us from finding peace in the Middle East. And a lot of this revolves around what Cynthia just said. I mean, we're not the UN. The UN exists to deal with these situations, but we've gone in and supplied military power that's continued the conflict, and we need to withdraw military support for not just Israel, but all other nations where there are dictators and, and civil conflict. And, and work with the United Nations to resolve this situation and get all sides involved instead of just us trying to be the little power worker and play the games and resolve the situations through a neutral party. Thank you. Jesse Johnson. First of all, those bunker busters were designed for, for aerial mountaintop removal in, uh, in the Caspian Basin uh, to put through the pipeline, oil and gas pipeline. Um, the, the issue, and, and as far as Israel's concerned, I, I believe that a, a boycott of military financing is a good first step. And then, much to the chagrin of our so-called president, um, I think mine's Al Gore. Um, but in, in that regard, uh, in that particular instance, I, th I think that this, this situation requires that communication that I was talking about prior. Uh, there's not enough communication, there's not enough negotiation, and there's nothing that's going to replace it even in this so-called war on terror. 
Uh, I don't know how that feeling is going to even hand over a sword in defeat. Thank you. <laughs> Jared Ball. Again, I, I'll have to use an autobiographical example to show where my biases are. My Jewish mother was born in New York precisely because her parents left Palestine, and it was Palestine because they felt tricked and betrayed by the Zionists who had convinced them to emigrate from Russia there in the first place. Uh, my black father, his experience and the experiences I've inherited as a black man dictate that we must deal again with the people here first. If you are going to treat black people and Latinos and indigenous people and white workers in this country the way you are, how in the hell can you expect that somebody else overseas would be treated better than the people right here? Um, I would echo what, what, what Sister McKinney said. I would listen to the voices on the ground, take them into consideration based on my own political biases, and come up with a solution that way. I don't want to give pie-eyed, you know, fanciful statements here as to what could or could not happen. But we need to, again, start here by redetermining, re-evaluating, uh, uh, and directing how we treat each other in this country before we can expect to have a positive influence anywhere else. Final answer to this question, Kent Mesplay. What's happening in uh, Israel and surrounding regions uh, is influenced by our military industrial congressional complex. This is just one symptom in one place of a terrible foreign policy. And really, to get at the root of this problem, we need to have a true separation of powers. No simple quick fix is going to do it. We need to get business out of politics. War is big business. War is tremendously big business. Um, I would say use diplomacy more. Uh, I agree. Politicians, statespeople need to listen. That's, that's a key skill. Um, I don't think there is a simple solution. Uh, I believe the Green Party leans more toward a single state solution, asking that both sides get along. Uh, there are Green Parties throughout the world, including Israel, and that, I believe, is not their policy. Thank you. What is wrong with the Farm Bill, assuming you all believe that there's something wrong with the Farm Bill, and what would you do to change what is wrong with the Farm Bill? What is wrong with the Farm Bill, assuming you all believe that there's something wrong with the Farm Bill, and what would you do to change what is wrong with the Farm Bill? Um, we're having difficulty here. The Farm Bill, um, what would you do to change the Farm Bill, assuming you think there is something wrong with the Farm Bill? Addressing the question of the Farm Bill, Cat Swift. I'm actually not familiar with the details of the Farm Bill, um, but I've heard from farmers that it doesn't work. And so, you know, I'm, I'm guessing the best way to do this is to get the small farmers together and hear what they have to say about fixing it and, and do those fixes because the corporate farmers are not, they're the ones that control how the Farm Bill is made. We know that. So we need to get the small farmers together and have them fix the bill and then just push that through Congress. Jesse Johnson. Well, <clears throat> certainly get away, get rid of aid, you know, uh, to and subsidies that uh, prevent us from feeding the people that need to be fed when there's about 30 million children in this country who are hungry. Um, one way we might be asked Willie Nelson, but I, but that that gets back to him, and and then you know, and then Arthur Daniels Midland, you know, pushing corn, and when you're taking food for fuel as opposed to using something else like hemp that we could be using that isn't necessarily used for food all the time. I, 
I, I, don't, I don't argue that, and, 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 it, and since the Scythians, it has uh, supplied our society with oils and, and vi viable food sources for a long time, until the 20th century, and isn't it strange that suddenly in the 20th century, you know, we, we have this plague called cancer and, you know, and heart disease, and so good point. Thank you. Jared Ball. I need to just say something real quick. Uh, I'm a little irritated at the previous question. I have to be honest with you. Uh, 1,200 people are dying every day in the Congo so we can have coltan in our cell phones. There are endless numbers of other problems going on that far outweigh, with no disrespect to those there, the problems being faced. I don't need to say outweigh, but need to be balanced with the problems that we face in the, the so-called Middle East, which is East Africa, or as some have said, middle from what? Um, right. As far as uh, my only experience with, with uh, the, the farm bill uh, is, is very limited and with, was, uh, uh, and with the farming as an issue in general through my work as, 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 at the Urban Agricultural uh, Project at the University of Maryland about a year, some years ago. And what I would really just want to focus on is to learn the details that would allow people in my black communities to get inexpensive, qu good quality food. To get to be to match the high quality uh, 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 that is found in uh, other parts of the country, uh, and I would want to deal with the, the distances that that farm food has to travel, why farmers are paid to not grow or to grow only a cash crop, and so on and so forth. It would be in that vein that I would look to deal with that problem. Thank you. And Ms. I would echo these comments. I, too, have not looked at the Farm Bill very carefully, but I, I do know this, that farmers should not be paid to not grow food, and that corn is overblown. It's not a good source of ethanol. Um, of, of over um, 41,000 um, um, stock items in a grocery sh store, sorry, about a quarter of those products contain corn. Um, corn is vital to the food supply of the world. Corn started here. Um, I, I thought some time ago how nice it would be since there's so much government subsidy of, of, well, foolish things that it would be good to somehow pay Native Americans even oh, some small percentage of, of um, of what goes on with, with corn uh, being such a hot commodity for all the years spent in, in developing corn from Teosinte. Thank you. Final answer with Cynthia McKinney. Um, basically, I, I, um, I did serve on the House Agriculture Committee and um, basically was astounded at the corporate influence in our uh, farming legislation and our agricultural, agricultural legislation. So I would eliminate the corporate subsidies. Uh, there's so much money in corporate welfare. Uh, we need to eliminate that. I would strengthen the family farmer because a lot of people talk about the politicians, they talk about family farmers, but they don't really do anything for them. So I would strengthen the family farmers. I would also make sure that, that, that we had a program to encourage organic farming. Um, I would also like to see in the Farm Bill some damages, of money set aside for damages to the black farmers and other minority farmers who never really received money even though the attorneys received millions of dollars and they continue to, continue to receive millions of dollars for discrimination that USDA admitted to. Um, I would eliminate uh, genetically modified foods. <laughs> I would also um, look at our land policy and our water use policies because, uh, you know, some of what we're doing is just absolutely not sustainable. Okay, that's time. Thank you. And this is a good last question, in my opinion. How will your campaign help the Green Party unite the various strains of the progressive movement, including labor and any other strain of the progressive uh, movement? mentioned Blair Mountain before. Blair Mountain is actually was a, an uprising in West Virginia pertaining to labor. Uh, the, the miners were looking to not be murdered in their sleep, have their homes 
taken away from them, not have to uh, uh, pay for their goods at company stores with company script. Um, I, you know, when I ran for governor, I was the only card-carrying pro-labor candidate, and there, there was a Republican and a Democrat there. Uh, as far as my particular campaign, once I'm allowed to uh, declare, I'm wondering why hasn't Ralph declared? But anyway, uh, from my point of view, I, I intend to, once I do declare, I'm going to take off on an old-fashioned Truman-esque whistle-stop tour across the nation. And I'm going to contact all of the different candidates, local greens growing ev everywhere across the nation, and let them come and meet the train. And we have the media there and use it as a party building apparatus Thank to you. put a green message across this land and it will grow. Thank you. Jared Ball. The work we've been doing, uh, again through this capital resistance presentation that Head Rock and I have been doing for some years now, <clears throat> not always in this context, but uh, most recently in this electoral political campaign process, um, has done, has proven, whether we do this at a traditional hip hop audience, which again is the most diverse audience in the world, uh, or whether we do this for, uh, as we did recently, for a majority uh, white working class, older male audience, uh, once we lay things out, as has been mentioned, as to what the problems are, how we can deal with them, and offer people the option and the alternative. Again, why we're involved, why I got involved, why Head Rock and I got involved from the beginning, was to help build this party, was to help build an electoral political option for all the progressives. And we want to lay a challenge out to them. Again, we don't believe in voting for evil, period. If you are progressive, if you want change, you cannot keep going back to the same mechanisms that brought us back here in the first place. And we now have an option for you. So be progressive and be proud to be progressive and stop pumping out, basically. Come on and get down with us. Can't mess play. And it's not just progressive, it's liberal. It's good to be liberal. Um, I'm, I'm a member of Service Employees International Union. I have been since I started working as an air quality inspector at the Air Pollution Control District. So in part the response is just by modeling um, behavior. Uh, I believe that unions have their place. My grandfather worked in a steel <coughs> mill and on his second last day of work he died and my grandmother lost the entire pension because of that technicality. So what I'm doing already is I'm running a serious campaign. I'm really running. I'm running an, an apologetic campaign. I'm saying it's good to be green. These are times for green solutions. These are times that green issues are coming to the forefront. So complementary or alternative medicine also is in need of support. And of course, alternative energy, which factors very strongly into developing true national energy independence and regional security as well. Thank you. And remember, register people green and be proud. Thanks. Cynthia McKinney. If there's one plea that I have, it is to please unite the party. How in the world can you expect us to go up against the mightiest force on this planet and we're not together. Please, it will take the kind of strength and courage to face the empire or to face that, that machine out there, and we can't do it divided. Um, I'm reminded of the, par the story that's told by Jim D. Eugenio in The Assassinations about Malcolm X. On the day that Malcolm X was murdered, he received a phone call from perhaps FBI agents because it was no secret that the United States government wanted him dead. He received a phone call and that call said, today is the day. Now Malcolm X could have told his wife, pack the children, we're going to go away. But Malcolm X 
kept his date at the Audubon Ballroom. He told his wife, pack the children, I want them there. And so what we're doing is very serious. This is not a joke. This is talking about starting a movement in this country. And you can't do it if this one doesn't talk to that one and this one doesn't like the other one. So please, I have never seen anything like I have seen in the Green Party. So when I ask my constituents, people who support me to come and join this, I want to be proud of what I've asked them to join. So please, come together. That is my community. The standing ovation, Cat. I don't envy you, Cat Swift. Final <laughs> comment. Well, it's hard to follow that. Um, but you know, and, and but it does come back to what I was going to say: is you can't bring in labor and Native American Indian populations and and various other or groups of people when people in the party haven't dealt with their own issues of racism, haven't dealt with their sexism, and. And you know, rabid veganism is you know, there's there's a lot of issues that we need to work on here. <laughs> yeah, down with isms. But but really, you know, when it gets down to it, when we go out and talk to people, they're gonna be united by the fact that we're speaking the truth about what's going on. We're not politician we're not doing the political speak and talking around the questions, we're actually answering the questions. And that appeals to voters. That's how I ran my city council campaign, and that's why I ended up with 30% of the vote. It's because when you speak the truth to people, they will, they will come and they will vote. First of all, thank you all for coming. I want to again thank my colleagues. I want to thank publicly my wife and my mother and my campaign staff and crew, uh, like Ken said, we've been running a very serious uh, and unapologetic campaign, uh, which has uh, proven difficult, quite honestly, for some of the reasons mentioned up here and some that, that need not be spoken about publicly. Um, we were thinking a lot about how we would close our portion of this discussion. It's not really a debate, it's a discussion among colleagues and, and comrades, and at least as, as I'm sure we all see this. <clears throat> the reason that, that I and my, my, my colleague, I mean Suzette Gardner, uh, Todd Burroughs, Malik Russell, uh, of course Head Rock, uh, Anita Rios, a co-campaign manager, much love to, to Mama Anita who couldn't be here today. Um, the reason we got involved was because of what we've been saying all day today, that we need to build an alternative movement. We need to come together uh, as, uh, um, on the basis of these shared politics, take certain risks, and in the light of the risks that have been mentioned here in, in name of Malcolm X and Dr. King, simply voting for Green or a Green Party candidate is not really a risk. It is a simple, basic step that any progressive, concerned citizen in this country would take. This is the only electoral political option. <laughs> we got involved, and usually when we give this presentation, I, I end by putting up a big, so try to imagine this with us, a big green square. And we say we have this green party, 15 seconds, this green party. Then we show a strip of red, and we say we want to bring in the Latinos and the indigenous to help with this green party that is awfully white. Then we put the final strip up, the black strip. We want to bring in our black brothers and sisters as well. And we have this beautiful, huge image of a red, black, and green flag. We want to help make this party the true party of liberation 
for everyone. The best, and I am going to close here. As, as I said at the beginning, I'm not a politician. I am a political being. I am a concerned citizen of the world. I am uh, a wannabe revolutionary. Yes. To the extent that those are our goals, we and uh, I want to, you know, share publicly with with, um, uh, with some discussions that we've had privately. Uh, we want to announce here today, and I see no reason to not do this, particularly after this discussion, that our campaign will become a full-out spokesperson, spokes uh, 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 presentation component, outreach component for the Cynthia McKinney campaign. We encourage you all. But I also want to say, with no disrespect to anyone else here on the stage, our goals we see best met through Sisters Campaign. We will support unequivocally any Green Party member who gets the nomination of this, this party. We are building a party, not thank individual you. campaigns. Thank you. And that is, thank you all very much. Thank you. And sisters, you have my blessing. Thank you. Closing statement by Kent Mesplay. Oh. Okay. After governmental responses to the after effects of hurricanes Katrina and Rita, it is apparent that we cannot wait for Uncle Sam to bail us out. In parallel with improving gov government to be more useful in times of crisis, we must prepare ourselves. I do not consider myself a politician, and sure, maybe there's a little denial involved. I, I see organizing politically as a way to effect great change in a short period of time. In the Green Party, the party with fresh ideas, lacking the obstacles to change that are found in the entrenched parties, one can find one's place rather quickly so that the skills and abilities are appreciated and used to build, build real, serious, lasting change. Beyond preparing for a three-day crisis brought about by earthquake, fire, or flood, Greens are concerned with a long emergency the slower cyclic changes that sneak up on us with unexpectedly long droughts, by other environmental stressors, by regional changes that go largely unnoticed by our business as usual, politicians, corporations, and ma major media. The oceans are grossly overfished. Most of the large fish are gone, having been taken down to a fraction of their former populations. Marine environments look shockingly destitute to the old timers who dove many years ago and now find themselves looking at mere remnants of underwater beauty. Old grove forests are still under siege. The Democrats aren't doing enough, folks. Just register people green and make sure you vote green. I've got more I could say, but that's what it comes down to. Thank you. Thank you. statement, Cynthia McKinney. I was born when many Americans, despite flagrant injustices, still had a deep and abiding faith in our country. People living overseas still believe that the United States was a beacon for liberty and freedom from oppression. There was an unshakable belief that the United States could become all that our dreams wanted it to be. I grew up in the tumult of the 60s when fire hoses and attack dogs were unleashed on children who knew that this country could become the country of their dreams. Four university students sat at a North Carolina lunch counter and forced this country to write a new page in its history because their struggle was right. On the night before his murder, Dr. King said that he was happy to be living at the end of the 20th century because people all over the world were saying, we want to be free. Now people have their eyes riveted on this country because the cries for freedom were heard in Haiti, Cote d'Ivoire, Venezuela, Ecuador, Bolivia, and Nicaragua. It's now our time. Those four North Carolina students showed us the power of one. Those elections in Haiti and Cote d'Ivoire and other countries show us the power of the people. The signs of decay are all around us. Our president believes that the Constitution is just a piece of paper. If we fail to stand up, what is it that our country will become? Those of you who are here today are the tested and the true. You have refused to abandon your radical common sense and have built a party worth moving into the major party status. I believe we can do that if we all act and move together. I'd like to thank Jared for his expression of support and for the truths 
that he reminded us of all today. But I want to thank you for building a wonderful party. I've visited 20, nearly 25 states. I've got 25 more to go to, plus the District of Columbia. And by the time this is over, I expect to have visited every state in our union, meeting the wonderful people of the Green Party and asking more people to join in this party. I believe that we can reach our goals, we can run a campaign, and we can win by our own definition if we do it together. Thank you very much for being here today. Closing statement, Cat Swift. Thank you all for coming. It's great to see that we've almost filled this place. I wanted Greens to have choices on the ballot, and I'm really happy that we have five candidates who are all competent, credible people who can anyone can get behind. And my hope is, is that we all bring in our own constituents because we're all going to appeal to different types of people. And when it comes down to the nomination, whichever of the five of us get that nomination, then all of our support goes behind that one person. And that's how we build the momentum to bring about the change and the election of a Green Party presidential candidate. And on down the line from there, because as we get ballot access for the presidential races, that means everyone on down all the way to Justice of the Peace can get ballot access and get elected because we all know that the more Greens we get elected, the more likely things are going to change for the better. And all the things we've been talking about here are going to come to pass. And we need to get moving and get people registered and help out states like Arizona who are almost done with their ballot access and need lots of help. And then move on to the other states. Georgia is still trying to get ballot access. Texas. Georgia is going to get ballot access. <laughs> <laughs> Texas is coming up in mid-March, they're in New York, Pennsylvania, and we need to help all of these parties. Just because you live in California doesn't mean you can't help. And so we need to get out and get people registered, and we need to get on the ballot in every state so that we can get our presidential candidate elected in November. Thank you. Final closing statement, Jesse Johnson. Your vote is never wasted. If you, if you vote for what you believe in, it registers. And you vote every day. You vote every time you pull a dollar out of your pocket and spend it on something. And you vote when you register. I'm not doing this for myself or for my family. But for the Mountain Party of West Virginia and the mountains that I love and the source waters for three quarters of the water, the, what little potable water there is left on this planet that, that comes from the Appalachian mountain range, I'm not doing it for the Green Party. I'm doing it for the hope and vision of a nation and our planet. I don't do it for a flag. I do it for this. This is who we are. It's the Constitution. That GD piece of paper George talks about. You know, like I said, I wasn't really wanting audience participation in here. I want it out there. You know, it kind of reminds me of something I read in Benjamin Franklin's autobiography. He talked about the speckled axe. There was a guy who had a, this axe, and he brought it to the, the local blacksmith, and he wanted the whole axe to look just like that edge, real shiny. The blacksmith kind of looked at him and says, well, I'll tell you what, you know, you can step over there, and you can start grinding that. You turn that wheel, and I'll grind this down until it, there's nothing but shiny axe for you to admire and, and, and hone and, and own and love. And so he grinded on that axe, and he ground, and he turned, and he cranked. Finally, as he was sweating and the blacksmith was watching, holding that axe to the grindstone, he said, you know what? This axe is just fine the way it is. 
I think I like a speckled axe. Well, folks, that's where we are in this nation. We've, we've come to a point where we're far too comfortable. We, don't, we have to give up some of our cell phones or whatever and get back to a sustainable lifestyle in a sustainable world with a sustainable nation. And if we follow this, it will sustain and it will endure. And nothing short of that will work. And Stalin said, you know, it's not, who, it's not the votes, how many votes you get, it's who counts the votes. Right. Well, we have to have clear and transparent elections and we cannot stop, we cannot back, we have to move forward and do what is necessary to get those elections so that the whole world looks at us and respects us for the shining example that we used to be. Thank you. are here with me today to show complete and utter solidarity with the Green Party of the United States and the Green Party presidential candidates. Our North America is desperate for a green vision with strong green leadership. Elizabeth May, the Green Party of Canada's leader, is changing the climate in the Canadian Parliament. And today, I am inspired by your very strong Green Party of the United States presidential candidates, and we are here to support you entirely. Myself and the Green Party, thank you all for your efforts and your actions. We support you, we respect you, we are with you, by your side, always, and we wish you all the success in the world. For the Green Parties from around the world, this is a huge turning point that we have all been waiting for. We are placing our faith in you, and may you feel our support with every word, every action, every new member that you get. So thank you. This is a global movement. We are here in it together, and we will succeed. If it's not this election, it will be, it should be this election, but for, from now until forever, the green movement is getting stronger by the minute. Thank you. And again, the Global Greens Conference this year is in May, from May 1st to the 4th in Sao Paulo, Brazil. You're all more than welcome to come. Let's do this together. So thank you. May 1st to the 4th, www.globalgreens.org. Thank you again.